one. Any ideas? What's the story? There I was, sitting with my dad, in the back seat of a taxi, heading for Manchester Airport. We were on our way to Copenhagen, which was exciting enough, but the most exciting thing was the going courtesy of Polydor Records, something which gave me the chills, just thinking about it. Apparently they've seen something in me, they're paying for a few days of recording and songwriting sessions in the Danish capital. At first I thought it was a joke. Now it was actually happening. I still can't quite believe it. I was just a fresh-faced, gawky 15-year-old working the odd weekend as a pot watcher for cash. I still do my GSCEs at school. Well, not today. Well, my friends were slaving away at their desks, counting the minutes until home time. I was getting off to my... Try my hand at being a pop star for a few days. It's all I've ever wanted to be. When I was 11 years old, I played Alice in my oh. school production of Alice in Wonderland. Not for one moment did I ever imagine. And just f- f- four years later, I began recording with producers and songwriters I looked up to, dreams can really come true. Of course, because of my age, Mum had insisted on Dad going with me and being my chaperone. Which you're thinking, which have would have liked me to have gone on my own. But in reality, I wasn't really ready to, or mature enough to look after myself just yet. As, m- as much as I hated to admit it, I needed him in there. I was still a teenager, trusting to living in a world full of grown-ups. This trip was bound to be an eye-opening in that regard. Well, a girl can't have everything, can she? At least not right away. Good things come to those who wait, and I could wait. Breathless of excitement, I stared at the window. As we approached the airport, the butterflies in my stomach getting bigger and every mile in my with every mile in my head I attended one of those M T V diary specials. I imagined like being like Britney Spears globe chopping, performing sold out shows and recording platinum albums. All that while we were looking incredibly beautiful and glamorous, if only. Dad was glancing at his watch. Clearly worried he might miss the flight. A voice brought me out of my nice drive dream. This is your big break, Recky, he said, smiling. You can put it off the world's your oyster. Keep doing him. Keep doing him. I can't help but laugh. It was typical, Dad. A born up in this. He was always telling me to seize the day. Keep carp de om, carp de om. Over and over again. Well, I guess it worked because here I am. I was. Taking a deep breath, I tried to keep calm, but I couldn't just, I just couldn't. Pressure was building on my dad's nervous energy fetched. Pressure was building on my dad's nervous energy infectious. I tended, I was trying, taking it all in in my stride. Inside, I was quaking with giddiness and nerves. The equal measure. Finally, the taxi dropped us off outside the de- departures. We hurried inside and our luggage. It was crowded with throngs of people. On the go, everywhere, you looked. The atmosphere was full of buzz and expectation. Waiting first was a manager, William Mo- R- Robinson. He spotted us through the crowds and shouted over, Hey, Kevin Vicky, before strolling over to us. Hey, little superstar, how are you? You mean at me, making me blush. I blush him because, as usual, he was staring at us. William sure loves to make a scene, all right. He'd been my manager and promoter for about six months. Fair to say, he exuded a jolly optimism when the volume turned up to the max. I never knew... I knew that knew that then, though, he had my best interests at heart, but little did I know how much trouble he'd go, to, go, go on to cause me. Dressed from top to toe, the best black suit he owned. William was a chubby normaler in the mid Thirties, bore the uncommon red resemblance to beat gay comedian. Even sounded a bit like him, hence my slight embarrassment. He's now going, great to see you, all right? He asked with wide screen as he put his arm around my skinny shoulders. As usual, lying across his right shoulder was a trendy canvas bag embezzled with Minden, Minden Music Industry logo. I guess it was a way of saying, yeah, that's right. Look at me, us. We're in the music business, so it's quite a bit of craving. It was going on. He always tried to look his best. He always played a part and was professional, unlike Dad. A favoring, more disheveled look, unshaven, and cut hair, 
and wearing his hair best checked lumberjack shirt for the occasion. Perhaps he's trying to be cool as much as I loved him. He's always got all my nerves. You could say I was a typical teenager in this crowd. He was naturally down to earth and talked to anyone and they listened to him. That was the Blarney in him. He's Irish Blarney. I found it odd that he wore his prescription glasses in sunglasses indoors. But he was being practical. He couldn't be bothered to carry around two bears with him. Maybe he thought that made him look cool too. I wasn't quite so convinced. We boarded the Scandinavian Airlines on flight around 10.30am. We were prepared for, for takeoff. William and Dad talked endlessly about their plans for the future. My future, record contracts, world tours, Grammys, you name it. They had it all figured out. They were expecting big things for me, huge things. I myself found this a little too far-fetched, but I, despite my daydreams of world stardom, and that last time I took looked in my mirror. I was still a gangly teenager who didn't grow up into growing, fully grown into herself yet. Could I really fit in the world of good smoke glitzy showbiz? Could I really share the world stage with all my, idol, with all my idols? Well, the girls were all body confident, glossy and flawless. I didn't even know what I was yet. Who was going to turn out to be? How could I take on such responsibility? if I didn't know who I was. I was scared that if I didn't, that if I dared to believe all this could be possible, I would fall in the pit of disappointment and regret all before I turned sweet 16. I turned to my studio chaperones, listened to them to talk about me like I wasn't there. The more excited they became, the louder they spoke. The more attention they were getting, the other but Ashes, I could see people staring over at us, wondering who and why this little girl being being talked about in such a raging way. I was going to my seat, knowing they must have been thinking. While I was fifteen, I looked like about twelve, blonde, slightly built, with an air of innocence and bordered on naive. Yes, naive, that was I. That I was what is what I was. I had no idea what they had. I was it was a good job, really. If I'd known then what I know now, I'd have gone and buckled my seat back right there and run the way back home to Plankton. Plankton, too late now. Just then, the aircraft taxied to the halt. I swung round for takeoff, making my stomach churn a little. All this talk of fame but put my nerves on edge. I'm now even more unsettled than before. I hid my anxiety behind a mask of cool... Dean's call, slipping on my headphones. I started to play Burns' crazy in love through my ears. That's, that's how the moment felt, a little crazy. As the engine roared and we thundered down the railway, my stomach turned again. I often have read that famous people decide that most moments of fame had been exactly like that. Described that the first moment of fame exactly like that. Like an aircraft taking off, I didn't realise how scary it would be. Moments later, we'd taken off and heading into the unknown. In more than ways than one, despite the fight flight, I kept fl- glancing over. William, who was talking on stop to my dad, but the music business. I knew that William had gone into business association with Robin Gibb. Imagine Ken Creighton, both of whom were supporting me and helping me develop in my career. Nevertheless to say, I was very flattered with a heart such a high profile artist such as Robin Gibb, like me, was actually interested in my project. Always admired the Bee Gees, that I was young and, and grown up and on this kind of music thanks to mums and dads, disco dancing. Appreciating they wrote incredible songs and a song Immortality was one of my favourites. So this is who I am. So how exactly had this trip come about? Well, Ken, Robin's manager, I sent some of my demos over to Robin's record label, Bundador. They liked them. Next thing I knew, I was rushing down the M6 in London, meet the top man of Bundador, Colin Barlow. I was quick, and it was quick as that. I can remember walking to Bundador's reception, Black Lion Lane, and just thinking, wow. So this is where it all happens. Ken greeted us and took us into Colin's office for the meeting. A room fitting 
for a big room music executive. His walls are covered in gold records and protect out expensive hi-fi equipment and light CDs. No expense spared. Dad had made a joke about Liverpool football scarf lying on a desk tagged being a diet in a wall van United van. Everyone laughed. It turned out that Colin was a real nice guy. He was young and understood the total opposite of how you imagined a big music exec to be. A Yanti Simon Cole, if you will. He would see that I was nervous, that he made me feel at ease. We chatted about my music interests and, and de- decision and direction I wanted to take. On a few moments, minutes, of talking, and to my amazing, he casually said to me, Right, Vicky, I've sent you to Copenhagen and booking you in with the Danish production songwriting team called DK Music. I was Godsmack, and though I didn't know then, in then, I later found that DK Music were made up of producers who worked with the likes of Bro and Keating, Samantha Mamba, Mamba and Sugar Babes and Blue. It seems so simple. I was going to Cake Hagen, just like that. I couldn't believe it. And neither could any of my friends at school when I told them. They thought I was even making them, even having them on, or just gone mad. I really had to pinch myself to make sure it was really true. Things like that didn't happen to me every day. School day, do they? Are my friends initially they doubt me. I thought I must be dreaming. But here it was actually happening now. I but I knew it wasn't. I wasn't dreaming. An hour and a half later, we landed at Copenhagen for grabbing a taxi into the city. It was early spring, and the whole place was covered it in melting slush and snow. Apart from the roads, that had sl- swept and now clear. And unlike in in England, where everything things seem to grind a shuddering halt. When there's even the slightest, lightest of snowfalls. Now here's a road with a full of buses and bicycles. On the move and weather slowing now and down. The city moved casually on and soon I'll be part of it. When we drove across the flyover, I got my first proper view of Copenhagen. A historic city canals, cobbled squares, cobbled spires, pitched buildings and famous harbour were all nestled beneath a shimmering dusting of white snow. Giving its Christmas chocolate bo- box feel about it, we carried on through the beautiful city. Soon, we're at our hotel at Remsen, and Blue, Scandinavia, which was on the impressive, which was an impressive twenty-six story steel and glass skyscraper, skyscraper, situated in the outskirts of the city centre. It was designed by a guy called Anarain Jacobson. Apparently one of Denmark's best architects. See, I may not have been at school, but I'm still learning things. We got to the taxi and took out our luggage. Out of the cold, I looked around at us smiling. I found a house a number of designer shops, which really made me plan my first activity, window shopping. I just pretend to be just like Julia Roberts and Pretty Woman. Just about the credit cards, the sugar daddy, or the high, high, high BC, C boots. I was in my element, but my good mood was dissolved when my dad told me we were to share a twin room. Now snoring wasn't really a recipe for a great night's sleep. The girl needed to look and sing like a superstar. I mean, I was more than a little ticked off at the news. This was a nerve-wracking trip. I wanted to have my own space.